Hey, good afternoon. It seems that we are live now. Um, this is one of the last sessions of the of the conference. I hope everyone's been having a good conference so far. Our topic is SQL Server Spatial Data Visual Mapping. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and make the slides as large as possible because the information on the slides today, as opposed to just backing me up, is actually very critical. So if you need to adjust your display to get your slides in the right position and to make sure that they're large and clear, go ahead and do that. And we'll go start. We'll get started. All right, there's one word that I would use to describe spatial data. The word would be complicated. And that would immediately be followed by awesome, powerful, incredible, and super cool. Although I guess technically super cool is two words, not one. Um, there will be various points we'll be stopping for question and answers. Since in our virtual format, it's not possible for you to raise your hand. Okay, well, okay, well, no. Actually, you could raise your hand. I just won't see it. Um, the, re, the rules of the regulations of Visual Fox Fest require me to tell you why you should listen to me. So here's why you should listen to me. I have all of this experience that you can read about here, as well as my company has experience in quite a number of industries. And here we are. This is what we're going to learn today. We have seven things on the agenda. Now, uh, the organizers sent me a template saying that I should have five sections. So, of course, I have seven. But even the seven sections are really only a bird's eye view from 30,000 feet because of the complexity of what we're talking about. And you can see here these seven things on the agenda. And at the very end, we'll get to actual VFP code to put all this together. But there's a lot of conceptual information that we have to learn in order to be able to put it together. Uh, on a personal note, uh, we all have to adapt a bit to, to our virtual, virtual status. Um, and it's a little bit different than when we're in person, and myself included, as you can see. We will be getting a hand today by our old friend, Spatial Sam. Spatial Sam is copyright illustrator Nessie Schiff, the greatest illustrator in the world. He, so Spatial Sam is a virtual assistant for today, although my daughter is real. All right, let's go. Let's start off with learning the types of spatial data and defining what we're talking about. Spatial data is always one of two types, geometry or geography. Every piece of spatial data is one of these two. It can't be both, and it can't be neither. Geometry is the first type we'll learn about. Geometry is really no different than the geometry you learned in high school. It's two-dimensional. It's a line or a shape of some type. Now, there are many different types of shapes, lines, ellipses, but the most common uh, geometric data type is called a polygon. Now, if you remember your high school geometry, it doesn't seem like that should be so complicated. A polygon is just enclosed on all sides, and this is a polygon right here. But so is this. In reality, polygons are any shape where the end of the line meets the beginning and it's enclosed. So this picture of the outline of the state of Illinois is a polygon. But this is not. This would be considered a line under our geometry category. Now, geometric shapes are not just shapes that we use to draw pictures. They're not just squares and triangles and polygons and ellipses and curves, etc. They're supposed to be used so that each one of those geometric pictures, if you will, that you draw is actually 
in some sort of X and Y coordinates in the world. So therefore, if I draw a square and I say this is a square for geometry and spatial data, that square has to be located somewhere. Therefore, when we have a polygon that has the state of Illinois, it can't stand off in the air by itself. It has to be located somewhere. And the idea is that they're located somewhere on the world. By the way, if you did not realize that that was the outline of the state of Illinois, it was. So anything on our planet, the polygon has to find a place. Now, the place could be flat. It could be standing up. It could be on its edge. And you could combine 3D to make a layout of a building. But each piece has to be somewhere. So therefore, each piece that we draw will have an X and Y coordinate for where on the world it's located. So we're going to use today mostly polygons. The truth is everything that we're going to talk about is applicable to lines, circles, points, and any other geometric data. But we're going to use the polygons, for example, because it's the easiest to work with when we want to build things. So even though we're going to talk only about polygons, other geometric shapes follow the same idea. Now, I'm going to try and create a polygon for the town hall of Peoria. Uh, my art skills are only slightly worse than my geometry skills, but let's give it a try. So in this map of Illinois, I put a little square for where the town hall of Peoria is. The town hall of Peoria is about right there. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, the town of Peoria is about, about an hour southwest of Chicago. And it's an exciting place to visit. It seems that that should be pretty simple. I draw this square, and all I have to do is look at the world and figure out the X coordinates across. And the Y coordinates down. And I have my town square of Peoria located smack in wherever I put it in the world. But the world is a 3D world. But drawings are 2D. So we have to know where the X and Y coordinates are in a flat picture of the world. Taking something that's round like the Earth and making it into coordinates that are flat is called projection, the science of projection. Most of us will find this looks familiar. In school, we had a map of the world. And this is a projection map because it projects X and Y coordinates on something that is really round. So, okay, that should be pretty simple. We'll just put our X and Y coordinates on there. Um, yeah, but why is it like that? Why isn't it like this? The answer is no reason. There's no reason one is better than the other. And in fact, there's actually, surprise, multiple systems of map projections. So if we try and store our X and Y coordinates for our polygon of the Peoria Town Hall, and we put in a data field that it's so much X across and so much Y down in the world, what happens when the user retrieves those coordinates? With one projection, Peoria is in the right place. But if we use a different map projection, Peoria is in the ocean. So how can we assign an X and a Y coordinate? All of a sudden, our our all of a sudden our X and Y coordinate, X here and Y here, has become a little more complicated. This X and Y on this map turns out over here. Why? Because we've taken something that's a circle and we flattened it out. And in reality, you can't do that. This projection map science is highly controversial because if you look at some of the old school maps, 
you will see that Europe is about the same size as Africa, when in reality, Africa is 10 times bigger than Europe. When you take something that's round and you squish it down to flat, the people doing it have to figure out how they want it to look. Now, fortunately, there is an answer to our dilemma of map project projection. And the answer is, we need another coordinate besides X and Y. We need X, we need Y, and then we also need to know which projection we're using for our X and our Y. So that when I have four polygons with X and Ys, I have to make sure they're all using the same projection or they won't be in the right place. That third parameter called the tuple is something that in normal geometry you don't have. Normal geometry, if something is a half inch from the left, it's a half inch from the left. In projection maps, if it's a half inch from the left, that could be in Canada or in the ocean. So we have to know which map we're using. So along with our X and Y coordinates, in our spatial data in SQL Server of a type geometry, we have to have a third parameter called the projection, what map projection we're using. You see this picture of this house? This is a set of polygons. And here's the neat thing. These polygons could all be one row of a table. This entire house, every single polygon, all 5,000 polygons, one row, one table, with a lot of X, Ys, and of course, something telling us what map projection we're using. The X and Y for every wall window. Now that's how the first type of spatial data works. The first type of spatial data, geometry. Are there any questions at this point? No questions so far. All right, let's keep going then. The second type of data is geography. Now, geography is completely different, except the same. It's specifically designed to designate a single point on the round Earth. The technical name for that is ellipsoidal data. So we're not it's not drawing a picture. It's taking one, if you took your finger and put it on the ground next to you, that point is somewhere on Earth. Geography is a piece of data describing where that point is. And geography is designed to be able to do calculations. Geometry shapes don't really calculate. But geography, since every point is a number, I can determine the distance between points, which point is farther away than the other, which point is higher than the other. Because I'm comparing only one, uh, one small point, I can do calculations on my geography data that I cannot do on my geometry data. Now, in order to figure out where you're putting your finger in the ground, it's based on latitude and longitude. Now, interestingly enough, two people have pointed out to me, I have it backwards. It's supposed to be longitude and latitude. And that's true in science. But in spatial data, latitude always comes first, or you'll have a big problem. So it should be very simple. Our geometry required us to figure out what map projection we were using. But certainly... Certainly, latitude and longitude are standard, right? No. SQL Server comes with over 400 default sets of latitude and longitudes, just default. If you were to run this query, select from the, the system table called Spatial Reference Systems, you would see hundreds and hundreds of latitude and longitude systems. Well, that's not going to be very helpful. If I stick my finger on the ground and I say it's 42 degrees latitude and 26 degrees longitude, based on what? So, of course, you would think the entire world would agree, but they don't. 
most of these Simpsons were invented far before a person could travel around the world. So just like we had a parameter for our geometric shapes telling us what map projection we should put our X and Y coordinates on, in geography, we have something called a spatial reference ID that tells us which set of latitude and longitudes to put it on. So while our geometry needed to know how we're flattening out the map, geography needs to know where does our latitude and longitude start. Now we're going to use, use Greenwich Mean Time as our latitude and longitude set. That's the one that you and I are most familiar with. And if you were to walk over to someone in America and say latitude and longitude, they would most likely think you're talking about Greenwich Mean Time, which is SRID 4326. Now this geography data we're much more familiar with in geometry data. Everything we do in the world in our daily lives is based on geography data. Our cell phone, you can't have a cell phone without geography data. The cell phone has to know what point it's calling, where to get a tower. And the tower has to know where it is. Everybody has to know where everybody is. And let's not even talk about mapping software. Deliveries, you could not get your Amazon deliveries while you're in quarantine. If the Amazon people couldn't specifically point to your house and say that's where it is in the world. Otherwise, just telling them an address is meaningless. The truck has to know exactly where it is. So there are only two types of spatial data that exist. Geometry and geography. One, everyone has to be one or the other. Geometric data is more likely to be used for flat maps and for designing buildings. Geographic data, route locations, and GPS... And under the hood, SQL Server stores all spatial data as lengthy binary data that's not human readable. And we'll see what we have to do about that. But every information, there, there are two types of fields that can be, uh, that, can be that can be entered into SQL Server, a geometric field and a geographic field. It's critical that we understand that. Any, any questions? Just one question. Um, in geography, is there an altitude parameter to enable 3D shapes? Excellent question. In geography, you can't have a 3D shape. Um, in geometry, you could have a 3D shape that has a shape that's flat, but it's elevated off the earth. So if I draw a triangle, who says my triangle is lying on the ground? Maybe it's 10 feet above the ground. The same thing with geographic data. I can't draw 3D, but let's say Amazon is delivering to the fourth floor. Well, the fourth floor is a completely different point than the bottom floor. So the answer is yes. Both geometric data and geographic data have another parameter for elevation. However, SQL Server does not support that. SQL Server will allow you to store it, but SQL Server does not support elevation at this point. But yes, indeed, there is elevation, and it's important. But SQL Server, um, as far as I know, there's no immediate plans for SQL Server to support elevation because it would add another level of complexity to it. Excellent question. That's it for questions. Any other questions? Any other questions? No, that's it. All right. Next section, data entry and retrieval. How do we put in and get out our geometric data? Sounds like a simple question. Huh. We can't enter directly in SQL Server because SQL Server uses a binary format that's not human readable. So we have to convert it to a SQL Server binary format. So open consortiums got together and created a set of standards to do that. Actually, they created three sets of standards and they're all used. The first standard, WKT, and most of these are abbreviations that you would have never heard of before. And it stands for well-known text. And it uses a list of numbers to list all the points on a polygon. 
So our outline of Illinois might have 200,000 numbers, whereas an outline of a square might have four numbers. It's arguably the most popular of the three formats. And SQL Server uses the polygon function in order to describe a polygon. You would literally type in this text with all of the points, making sure that the last points are the same as the first points so that the shape is closed. Simple. We can also do this polygon. And we can take our polygon function and we can put multiple, multiple, multiple parameters of polygons in there. There is no limit. So that picture of the house has probably got eight to 900 parameters to the polygon function. Now, I could put each of those eight or 900 polygons into separate rows in my table. And especially when people are beginning in spatial data, they will do that because otherwise they get confused as to what they're doing because this is just a bunch of text. However, you could combine it literally one row in a table would look exactly like that using WKT, the well-known text. SQL Server uses the function ST, geom from text. And that converts one way from WKT to SQL Server. So let's enter some data. Yay, our first function and our first piece of data. We're going to use the, uh, the SQL Server Management Studio to enter. And what we're going to do is we're going to first create a table. And the table that we're going to create is going to be called spatial table. A spatial table only has two columns. One is the ID, and the other is a geometry column. We're going to call it geom column one, and its type is listed as geometry. Then we're going to insert into our table using our stgeom from text function our polygon. We have to preface geometric functions with the word geometry. And then this will put our polygon into the gemcal1 field in SQL Server format. And we successfully entered a row, which is what we like to see. Now, it's in this table just like any other data type. I could have blobs and varkars and binaries and everything else in my table, and one column is geometry. Uh, let's get our polygon back out of our table, of our spatial table. Well, we can use any SQL statements that we want and operate them on geometric data. And here's where we really get into the nuts and bolts of why this is so popular. Select from spatial table selects out my polygon and where it is in the world. Except one tiny problem, but it has a bunch of zeros and zeros, zeros there that we don't really understand. So we're actually going to use SQL Server's function to get it back into its WKT format. Now, don't worry. We're going to see how we take this and use it in VFP pretty soon. But WKT is only one of the three standards. And what we're going to see is that a lot of uh, the, the geometry and geology, geography objects have a lot, of, uh, a lot of functionality attached to them and we'll come back to that as we progress, and we'll come back to how to read this into VFP. But this is the first of our three ways to get data into and out of SQL Server is to use this well-known text, WKT. 
and SQL Server has a function that will take it from Polygon into SQL Server and from SQL Server back out to Polygon. Now, the other two types of entering are just as well used and just as much, just as, I'm sorry, just as frequently used, and we need to know them. The next one is well known binary, WKB. Easy to understand, hard to use. To enter our one polygon that had four corners would have taken about 50 lines of code. And it's rarely, rarely used by people. The most common purpose of WKB is for data exchanges between systems. Geography and geometry data are large and slow. And when I'm exchanging 200 million geographical points to another system, I don't really want text. So I would use the well-known binary format. And there's a third format called Geography Markup Language, GML. And this is designed for the Internet and uses XML. Hey, finally, something familiar to us. So Geography Markup Language is usually used for displaying something on the Internet or for allowing people to enter uh, things on the Internet. And this is what our polygon would look like in GML. Starting here. That's the same as our polygon from our well-known text. It is uh, um, becomes somewhat lengthy and cumbersome for anything other than simple things. However, it was designed to be compatible and be used with XML. Despite that, it's not the most popular format. WKT is the most popular format. All right, we got well-known text, well-known binary in geography markup language. Three and only three ways of describing and locating geometric shapes to SQL Server. Are there any questions about this? No questions at this time. That's our geometric data. I'd like to also put into SQL Server and get out of SQL Server some geographic data. Let's do that. Guess what? It uses the same three standards. Well-known text, well-known binary, and geographic markup language. But it describes an exact point, not a shape. It describes a point or a location, one point. And therefore, we're going to have to enter it as a point. Let's enter the coordinates for the Willis Tower in Chicago and the Eiffel Tower in New York. So we're going to, once again, create a table. And it's, we're going to have, we're going to have uh, um, uh, three columns here, our ID column, the name of the building, and instead of geomcal, we're going to have geogcal, and that's going to be type geography. So I'm going to insert Willis as the name of the building. And then I'm going to use the geography function to the in the SQL Server point function to specify three things. Now you can be a little sloppy with your geometric polygons in the identifying the map projection that they're used because you it's sort of up to you if you only but points require three arguments. Latitude longitude, and the SRID that's used. As someone asked earlier, you could add an elevation, but SQL Server will ignore it. So this, by the way, does happen to be the latitude and longitude for the Willis Tower in Chicago and the Eiffel Tower in New York. We use the point function to identify one point in the world. Now, you notice that point really has no defined size. It's a point. The smallest measurable point on the world is described by the latitude and longitude. And because of that, you'll notice that it's out to six decimals. That's nothing. 
because you're only describing one point in the world. It's not uncommon for spatial data to have 10, 15, or 20 decimals. Because, again, it's only that point on the ground. So it has to be very precise. Latitude, longitude, and SRID. I mentioned earlier, but it's something to keep in mind that you could just start off by always using 4326, which is Greenwich Mean Time and familiar to most of us. All right, let's get the data back out that we used our point function. We put it into the point function. All we have to do is select it. And we're going to use our function provided by SQL Server to get it out as text. And instances of geographical data also have latitude and longitude built in. So I'm going to also pull out, even though I didn't have to enter it because it's a function of the instance of the geographical data, the latitude and the longitude. So I'm going to have the name of my building. I'm going to have my point function with the three parameters, the latitude and the longitude. Getting pretty cool. All right, so we can do calculations with that because every point has three parameters. And only the first two designate the, the, the place where the point is located. So therefore, we can add, subtract, multiple. We can do all kinds of things. And we're going to do that in VFP. But first, just a little bit more. We need to know about functions. We have to be able to manipulate our data in SQL Server. There are hundreds of operations that can be performed on spatial data. However, all standard SQL Server functions do not work on spatial data. And all spatial data functions do not work on any other data type. So SQL, a spatial data was something added to SQL long after it came onto the scene. And therefore, it's been retrofitted. And one of the ways it's been retrofitted is that none of the functions that currently exist will, or operators that currently exist will work on Spatial data, you need your own, it needs its own functions and its own, uh, its own operators. There are, on the last count, something like 900 and some spatial functions. We're going to use a few today. We're going to use something called buffer with tolerance. This is just unbelievable. It creates an instance of the spatial data point and X meters all around it. So if I want to know if you get free delivery because you're within 25 miles of my restaurant, I'm going to do a SQL query and use buffer with tolerance for everything, for whether or not your address is 25 miles close within the buffer, toler, buffer with tolerance of my restaurant location. ST union is a very important function because it joins two spatial objects. When you put all your geometric objects together to get a big map, you have to join them together. So we're going to try this with Minnesota and Wisconsin, which are adjacent states. Sure everybody knew that. This is a map of Minnesota. We're going to ST union it with a, with a geometric polygon with our polygon function representing Wisconsin. And we get one polygon, one data item, that's combined Minnesota and Wisconsin. This is how maps are made. Flat maps are made by taking all of the polygons that represent different states, counties, oceans, cities, etc., and joining them all together with a union. Now, we can also use something called ST intersects, which returns true or false if the objects overlap each other. ST intersect, does Minnesota intersect with Wisconsin? False. I can use ST equals to see whether or not 
my two spatial datas are actually equal to each other and whether they have the same point. I can use distance. Google darn near burns this function out. Distance takes two parameters of two geographic data points and tells you the distance in meters between the two points. Now, you'll notice on the slide it says meters, but sometimes I say miles. Almost all SQL Server functions require that the results and the input be in meters. Now, the standard does not call for that. The standard calls for specifying what measurement is used with each piece of data, meters, miles, etc. But SQL Server generally works with meters, and you're best off leaving it in meters. So ST distance will tell us the number of meters between two points. Now, that's as the crow flies, or, or actually rather as the crow walks across the earth. It doesn't take into account roads. It doesn't take into account buildings. It doesn't take into account oceans. It's the direct distance between two points on the face of the Earth. And we saw already before that there are hundreds of operations that can be performed, and there are some key functions like latitude and longitude that will be used just all the time. Right. This is the URL where you can get a list of current functions. And these functions are uh, described in Microsoft documents. And of course, since they're described by Microsoft, it may take you a while to wade through it. We need another thing, though, before we can get to our VFP programming. We need indexes. Aha! Something familiar. Indexes. Now we're talking. We know about indexes. Spatial data is very slow, and so therefore it needs indexes, even more so than most data. As long as the table has a primary key on it, you can create data for a spatial index. And you can index on those columns, our geom column, our geog column. We can index on them. We can literally index every point in the world, but we can index every polygon that's part of our house. And when we want to know where the window is, our index will deliver it to us right away. Let's see how a basic index is constructed for geom geometric data. Well, it looks a little complicated because there's some words there that we've never seen. So we're going to break it down. I can give you a chance to see Spatial Sam asking us to break it down. All right. The first part is standard SQL, uh, standard SQL syntax for creating a index. However, we got some things here we've never seen before, a bounding box. An index for geometric data needs a bounding box. And that tells it only geometric items within these points, within this square, should be included in the index. So if I have a geometrical shape and its left point is negative 190, it will not be indexed. Now, why is that, you say? Imagine a polygon covering the map of Canada. And every single small display within Canada on the map needs its own entry in our table, and therefore we want to index it. Well, we would end up with indexes impossible to manage, and SQL Server can never handle it. The indexes will become too large to manage. Spatial data is enormously complex. To index it without any regard to where it's located for geometrical data would re require indexes virtually the same size as the table. Larger shapes, you, you want to use larger bounding boxes. You also have something you've never seen before called grids. Grids have four levels as, long, as well as cells per object. Now, I would love to explain to you how grids and cell per object works. 
However, it requires a very in-depth knowledge of grid theory and a very in-depth knowledge of the technical construction of SQL Server indexes. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with using these defaults. To, but keep in mind that you may want to increase the cells per object to increase performance. So we have bounding boxes and we have grids added to our regular index creation. If we index on geographical data, it looks pretty similar. And in fact, it is similar, except it has no bounding box because it's just a point. So geographic data also has a grid level and cells per object, but no bounding box. These are required parameters. You cannot create an index without these parameters. Any other index parameters you wish to use that you would normally use in SQL Server, if it makes sense to use it with spatial data, you can use it. But bounding boxes for geometric data and grids for both geometric and geographic data have to be specified. Without indexes, the performance will just be unacceptably low. All right, now before we actually jump into VFP, are there any questions at this point? Yes, there's a few. Um, can, you can you have operations on geometry like add? Um, you can, you can, yes. yes. There's an equivalent function to join together two geometric shapes. Okay. Uh, is it, oops, it scrolled on me. Uh, there we go. Is it possible to rotate the polygons when joining? Is it possible to rotate polygons when joining? That's a very good question. Whoever asked that question gets a gold star on their VFF chart. That was Barbara. Um, I, I believe there is a function that will rotate that polygon. Um, but I, I'm only 90% sure of that. Okay. Can I get or store a geographic polygon like a street from which I have only some geographic points for an area to be controlled? Um, ask me that again. Can I get slash store a geographic polygon like a street from which I have only some geographic points for an area to be controlled? No. You need all the points of the polygon. Okay. For driving distance, instead of as the crow flies, we would still need to use a third map, a third party mapping API. Is that correct? I uh, got a little feedback. Ask me that again. Sorry. For driving distance, instead of as the crow flies, we would still need to use a third-party mapping API, correct? That is correct. Okay. How does SQL Server for geospatial stuff compare to using Postgres and PostGIS? I'm going to have to move my speakers over because I've got feedback. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to ask you to ask me again. I apologize. Sure. How does using SQL Server for geospatial stuff compare to using Postgres and PostGIS? Um, it's very similar because it's based on the same concepts. ArcGIS would transfer data in and out of SQL Server using a well-known binary format, and SQL Server could provide data to ArcGIS in well-known binary format. Okay. Why are there geographic and geometric types when both refer to a location on the Earth? Because geographic is a point with really no defined size or shape. Geometric has a defined size and shape to its location. Can the points of a polygon be geographic data? Can you use geographic data? In other words, not, not yes and no, not directly, but you could query and get enough points from the geographic data to then construct a geometric data, yes. Okay, that's it for questions. Alrighty. Let us jump right in now to VFP project number one, map locations. All right, the goal is to locate the closest airport in the United States to the user and put it on a Google map. So the first thing we need is a table of all the airports in the United States and their geography parameters, their points. So we're going to create a table airports. 
and we're going to have these fields in it. The code for the airport, all airports in the United States have a three-letter code. The actual name of the airport, the city, the county, the state. The elevation we will not use because SQL Server does not support that. And we will use geography for the point of where the airport is located. Now, I was surprised by how many airports there actually are in the United States. However, in the white paper, in the appendix, there's a code that will import for you all of the airports in the United States. I, I think it was something like 500 airports. All right, now, last year at Southwest Fox, there was a session on incorporating Google Maps into your VFP applications. It had some interesting shortcuts, and it explains the history and background of some of the GIS and GPS functions. And there's a, a URL where you can currently download it. Uh, a shameless plug. It was actually my session. You can get a Google Maps API free from Google. Now, when you ask for an API from Google, they will ask you which API you want. There's about uh, 25 of them. You want the one places. Now, one quick note, I it says, it says on the slide here, the URL strings for Google are very unforgiving. The slightest mistake will invalidate the results. You will not just get back results you don't want. You'll just get back nothing. All right, so the code in the white paper, which you can see, creates a form. It's not a complicated form. It's a form that has an image canvas on it. I'm sorry, it has, it has a, a, and it has one, two, three, four fields for entering name and address, and it has a command button. The user fills in their name and address. And then the locate button does the heavy lifting. What we have to do is four things. We have to parse the address. Google will not allow you to put in addresses that have not been parsed, house number, direction, street, city, state, zip code, etc. If you put Chicago, Illinois together, you will get an incorrect answer, or it won't allow you to even ask the question. So we have to build a call to translate the address into latitude and longitude. Because I type in 2848 West Lunt, that does really nothing for me. If I want to be able to figure out the closest airport, I need to know where 2848 West Lunt is. So I'm going to ask Google to translate my address into latitude and longitude. Then I'm going to select from my table all the airports that are within a certain distance of that latitude and longitude, and then I'm going to display them. So once I press that locate button, the first thing I'm going to do is I parse the address into four different parts. Combine it with the city and state. I've blanked out that my API here, you would substitute your own API. We would create an HTTP object and and uh, and get that URL that we just constructed. And Google will return to us in our HTTP object the answers for latitude and longitude, as well as a whole bunch of other things that we probably don't care about. Except there's no way to know whether or not Google accepted the address as being good. And if it's not accepted as being good, the HTTP object will not come back. Or at the very best, it'll come back without anything attached to it. So therefore, we need to try and catch to see whether or not we can actually get that URL or whether or not we made some sort of error. Sorry, once we have that, We pulled out the latitude and the longitude. 
Google returned to us an HTTP object. And the response text, response text had in it as the first thing is the latitude and longitude. So we pull that out of the response text, and we're going to use that. If for some reason we were not able to construct a proper query to Google, then we will just give the user a message and go home. All right, now we need to create our SQL for SQL Server. The first part of our SQL is going to define our point. This is the latitude and longitude we got from Google for 2848 West Lunch, Chicago, Illinois, 60645. 4326 is our system of latitude and longitude. Standard American use, Greenwich Mean Time. And then we're going to declare a variable that is a buffer around our address. So I want everything for 25,000 meters around the point where the latitude and longitude is. So 25,000 meters in any direction will fall within this buffer with tolerance. These are all functions of functionality that we've never dealt with before. Now we're going to make create our select statement. And we should take note of a few things here. So the first thing I'm going to do is, in case I need it, I'm going to select whether I'm selecting a geometrical geographical field just to make sure that I get it right. And the main thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take out from location back into WKT so that I'll be able to read it. So we're going to put it in WKT format, in our polygon format. And we're going to pull out the latitude, the longitude, the name of the city, state, and county, as well as the name of the airport. And then... We're going to pull out the distance from my house. And we only want to get it where the distance from my house is within our 25,000 kilometers intersects with it. So it's a little complicated, but the key points are that I'm only pulling out the latitude and longitude here. You'll see why in text for a moment. In order to filter my SQL, I've set a variable that's 25,000 meters around my latitude and longitude. And I only and I filter for any time the location I'm pulling out intersects with my 25,000 buffer. As a bonus, I'm going to pull out a field that shows me the distance from my house. But the filter is what's going to show me whether or not it intersects. There's our intersects that we were talking about before. I'm just going to hit this one more time because of the importance of what I'm saying here. And that is that this filter in the where is what does the heavy lifting. And it says, uses the intersects function. So anything in the search area and the search area is we set up as 25,000 kilometers will be included in our SQL.
Now, the truth is, is that sometimes I also union it with where my actual house is in case I want to plot that too. That's not necessarily necessary. So we're going to just skip over that. All right. Now I've, I'm going to send my SQL to SQL Server and I'm going to create a cursor air one. Now, really, we should give the user some sort of means to select whether he really wants the closest airport or the second closest airport, etc. But I put a browse in here so we can get a picture of what it is that we're getting. Of which the picture is said gone. Okay. The cursor error one is going to have in it every airport in the distance from my house, as well as the latitude and longitude. With that latitude and longitude, I'm going to once again ask Google a question. And this question is going to be, please bring me back a map that has that airport on it. And I provide the latitude and longitude. So let's just go back to our pseudocode for a minute. So that we can make sure we understand what we just did. We parsed the address 2848 West Lunt into 2848 West and Lunt and Chicago and Illinois and 60645. We asked Google to give us the latitude and longitude for that address. Assuming that we sent it correctly. Then we selected all airports that with an X distance of that latitude and longitude by using the ST intersects function. And then finally, we're going to make another call to Google to display the map on our VFP form. Dear sir, this is the closest airport to your house. Congratulations. What's interesting is when you go to some sort of application or site or whatever and you ask for the airport closest to your house, probably never thought about how much really goes into that and how complicated it is. So we took the address, we put it into latitude and longitude, and we figured out what intersects with our latitude and longitude, and then we display that latitude and longitude on Google. You can really take off from here. Uh, you, you could, you're, it's only really your imagination. Google has a lot of things you could do with it. Delivery addresses, fire stations, locations for deliveries, analyzing delivery data, planning routes, minimize travel. All of that can be done by using the same basic idea, getting latitude and longitude, determining whether it intersects what you want, and then displaying the results. And if you really think about it, you'll realize how many industries and facets of our lives really use this kind of combination of mapping with spatial data. Are there any questions about our first application of mapping? Uh, there are some questions, but they're, they're a little bit older ones. They're not actually about this. Um, can you calculate the area of a polygon? Yes. I thought so. Is there a function to tell if a geographic point is inside a geometric? Um, no, not directly. Uh, you could convert it into the, you, could, you could convert, but no, there's not a direct function. Okay. Uh, does the table uh, cursor air one that you created have multiple records or just one? In my example, I said any airport that's within 25 miles so it would have multiple records. But I could sort it by how far away it is. And the last question is, for distance measurement between two, two uh, X points, is the distance measured as a great circle, actual shortest distance, or direct point to point, which looks like a straight line between the points but isn't the shortest distance? No, it follows the Earth. That's it for questions. All right, we have another project now. We're going to draw some shapes.
I'm going to draw some shapes of some airports. Our airport field has a type geography, but let's also add a field type geometry. So we'll get the shape. Now, I don't have the shape of every single airport. So I'm going to assume that all airports have a polygonal shape with six sides. We'll talk in a minute about how I would actually get the data for the shapes of the airport. So I'm going to insert that into my table. Now I've got the four corners of, uh, or the six corners of my polygon, the X and Y coordinates. Now I'm going to select all of the geometric data from airports using the WKT format. However, if we do that in VFP, we have to make sure that we use var cares because SQL Server will return everything as memos otherwise. I'm sorry, SQL Server will return everything incorrectly. We want it to return a memo field so that we can open the memo field and parse what's in it. So we're going to have the WKT of the location of the airport, and we're going to have the geometric points of our polygon. We're going to have two things now. Let's make sure we're clear on that. We're going to have the WKT of our location. WKT, I'm sorry, yeah, that's our location as a point. And then we're also going to have a polygon that has all the points of the airport. So we have a point where it's located and a point to describe what it looks like all in the same table. So we've got a geometric shape and a geographical point. And now we have a record set. No, oh, here's my graphic. You can see that uh, geographic data is represented by, by, by points. And the geometric data for our polygons comes back in WKT format as a polygon. Now we're rolling. Now we could use the VFP shape objects um, and the poly points property to draw these polygons onto the form. But GDI Plus gives us far more choices in how to present the shape. So we're going to take a blank form. We're going to put from the GDI plus X class library from VP, VFPX and add an image canvas. Now, if for some reason you are not really all that up on your GDI plus, Doug Hennig happens to have a wonderful set of white papers on his website that take you from beginning to end how to use GDI plus. Yay, Doug. So we're going to need an array to pass to GDI plus for a polygon. GDI plus has a polygon drawing function, and it'll take an array of X, Y coordinates. Hey, we just got a WKT that lists all the coordinates. And hey, GDI plus takes coordinates for a polygon. So let's just take our polygon that we got back in WKT and put it into an array. The only thing to be careful of is that don't check for empty, check for null, because SQL Server will return null. But now we've created an array. Almost the same as our polygon, just without the word polygon. So we took our polygon points, and we created an array. Now we're going to use GDI+. Plus. The heavy lifting is done by the arrow here. And that heavy lifting is the draw polygon function. And the draw polygon function, we've told it to use the tan color and use the points that are in the array A cool. So we took our polygon statement that we got back in WKT, we made it into an array, and we passed that array to the draw polygon. Awesome! Now we should have all of our airports drawn on the VFP form. 
except you're not going to get anything. The form is going to be blank. The reason is there's another problem. Our polygon points originated from a single location, and they're so close together, the results are too small to display on a VFP form. Remember, the coordinates for geometric and geographical data cover the entire Earth. So our polygon coordinates for some airports, look how close together the coordinates are. Here it's at 100.22954, and then it's at 100.23105. That is too small of a difference for VFP to measure and draw. It's actually too small of a difference for Windows to measure and draw. So we have a problem. How do we know what shape our airport is in? We've got a point that we, that we will use to put it somewhere. But our polygon was supposed to tell us how to draw it. We know where it is, but how, we don't know what sides it has. Very good question. We need outlines. We need polygon outlines so that for every airport. But... If only it were that simple. We'll discuss how to get polygon. I'm sorry. How to get polygon. Uh, we'll just got to get polygon shapes for many known locations so that we could use it for each of our airports. It's far more complicated than that. And since our polygon has dimensions, X, Y, that are based on the entire Earth, VFP would have to be able to scale down onto one form the entire Earth. And to draw an airport on a scale down Earth that far, is too small to be seen. So we would need to put the airport, to locate the airport, the point, and then we would need to have a shape so we would know what our airport looks like. But you know what? Let's go ahead and map our points. Maybe we'll do better with geography than we did with the with the with the shapes. This time we're using the point. And the heavy lifting is done with the GDI plus function fill ellipse. So I create a little dot for everywhere there's an airport. And guess what I see on my form? Still nothing. Why? Because point coordinates are based on central media. They have negative numbers. You can't have negative numbers when you're drawing things on a VFP form. So let's add some numbers so that we can get it into the positive range. Now we're shooting fish in a barrel. Here's all of our airports based on the world. Let's add a little map from an image of a map of the United States as a background. Hello, there's all the airports that this person selected. Now, we can do anything we want with this in terms of distance, intersecting, etc. We can draw this. We can send it to Google. We can draw, continue to draw it on a VFP form, etc. Are there any questions about, the, uh, about that project? Uh, just one question. Can SQL Server handle curves? Yes. That's it. All right, I will add one more thing before we summarize, and that is the shapes of our airports. The description in WKT of our airport polygons, a long series of coordinates. It would be nice if we could find some predefined outlines for things like states, airports, countries. That's not as easy as it probably should be. SQL Server, as we know, has three takes three open open standards. WKT, WKB, and GML. And shapes are never in those formats. Shapes are in a format called shapefile. There are very few repositories of shapefiles. But there is one at the U.S. Census Bureau. And it's free. And there's a utility you can get that will import that shape into SQL Server. So you can literally download the outline of all the states 
and use this utility to put an outline of each state into SQL Server. And you could get an outline that was not really true to the world, but that was bigger that you could use to draw. It wouldn't be true data, but you could use it to draw. All right, spatial data comes in two forms. This is what we learned today. We learned about geometry, the two-dimensional description of a shape. We learned about WKT, WKB, and GML formats. We learned how to enter data. We learned how to retrieve it with our SQL statements. Geography is the other type of data we learned about. Defined point on the Earth, one point, along with an SRID for what kind of latitude and longitude it's using. Uses the same WKT, WKB, and GML formats. So if we look at these new data types, you really have to start using your imagination. Function indexes, how to create SQL statements to use spatial operators. We connected our data to Google Maps into VFP forms. Spatial data is still data. However, the power of spatial data can be used in a variety of ways, and it's ubiquitous today. Try working with it. I think you'll see what it can do. And on behalf of, Sp uh, of Spatial Sam and I, I would like to thank you very much. And now we'll take any questions. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much.